president-elect, uh, engineer Tilak de Silva, um, chairman of the civil engineering uh, sectional committee, um, ma engineer Major Nisank Vatlapandar, other members of the council of the ISL, past presidents, distinguished guests, um, Mr. Brian Pereira, the son of Professor E.O.E. Pereira, and ladies and gentlemen. I must thank uh, the President-elect for the uh, introduction that gave me much more than I uh, deserve, uh, because uh, my tenure at the NERD Center was for a brief uh, one year um, period. In fact, until my successor came, I had the dubious honor of having the shortest tenure as the chairman. So it was not from 2001 to 2012, but only 2001 to 2002. Whenever I think of um, Professor Eoi Pereira, My memory goes back a long way to something that happened a long time ago. But it is very clearly etched in my memory. The year was uh, 1975. I was a young second year student in the Faculty of Engineering at uh, Peradil. That year, the faculty was uh, celebrating its uh, 25th anniversary, and there was a week-long celebration. And the culmination of this uh, celebration um, was uh, a dinner dance, aptly named uh, Silver Night. Being uh, second-year students who were at the uh, very close to the bottom of the uh, pecking order in the student uh, organization hierarchy, um, we were given a not very glamorous uh, job to do, to um, be the doorman at the uh, uh, dinner dance. But this was different. Something really wonderful happened to us who were the domain in that memorable night. Uh, sometime towards midnight, I was with uh, another group of uh, my batchmates, uh, manning the main entrance to this uh, drawing office one where we had this uh, function. And uh, after some time, we noticed that a, a group of senior dons on their way out, coming towards the door. And in the middle of them was Professor E.O.E. Pereira. We, of course, went back and made way for uh, them to pass. Professor Pereira nodded at us and passed. He took a few steps and then stopped, turned back, and waved at us and bid good night. This I can remember very vividly still, and it was the highlight of the day, and it was worth all the trouble of serving as the doorman that evening. Of course, we knew who Professor E.O. Pereira was at that time. You know, his name adorned the main auditorium of the faculty. His portrait was gazing at us from its elevated position uh, on the outside the corridor uh, of the library walls. But this was the first time I had seen, I had met, if you can say that, uh, that was a meeting, the legendary founder dean of the Faculty of Engineering in person for the first time. Alas, for me, that was the last time also. Now that uh, memorable night, I never thought 
that one day I will be asked to deliver a memorial lecture in honor of uh, this great engineering education pioneer at a prestigious institution like this. This is a rare privilege for me, and I am deeply honored <coughs> by the trust that the IESL has uh, placed on me. I want to thank everyone associated with this uh, memorial lecture for giving me this opportunity, especially the Council of the IESL and the uh, sectional committee, the Civil Engineering Sectional Committee, and its chairman, um, Engineer Major Nisankar Vasilapandra, and everyone else in this institution uh, who have had a hand in organizing this today. If you were listening to me carefully, by now you would have realized that I did not have the privilege of being a student of uh, Professor Eoi Pereira. When I entered as a student to the faculty, he had already left the university service and retired. But still, I feel as if I was a student of Professor Eoi Pereira. His spirit still guides the faculty. Not only that, all my teachers at the Faculty of Engineering at that time were either his students or his colleagues. Professor Pereira knew that the soul of his young faculty <coughs> was the teachers that he would uh, recruit. So he was uh, very uh, particular about this, and he recruited the best from among the graduates of that faculty, and got them trained in the best universities in the world, and got them back. They came back and continued the work that Professor Pereira had begun. So I feel that even though I was not really a student of his, I am still a student of his in that sense. I am very grateful to him and uh, the other um, academics who served the Faculty of Engineering for giving me the wonderful opportunities that I um, enjoyed at the Faculty of Engineering. I'm ever so grateful to them for that. Now, uh, you would, um, let me put this way. I am a student of the students of uh, Professor Perry. Now, a child of a child would be called a, a grandchild. If we apply the same rule to a student of a student, the result uh, is a little bit pompous. So let us not do that. I will just say that I'm a second generation student of Professor Eoi Pereira. I think this description uh, will apply to many of you in this audience. In addition to being not very pompous, this particular terminology has a distinct uh, advantage. It allows us to talk about third generation and fourth generation and fifth generation students. We will be able to refer to the many generations of students who are yet to come to this faculty when we do this. I think, I hope, 
there will be many more generations of students who will come to this faculty and other faculties in this country in the present public um, university system. We hope there will be many more generations. And I am sure that would have been the dream of Professor E.O. Pereira when he was guiding this young faculty through its infancy. So today, I want to invite you, nay, I want to challenge you to think about this dream. Actually, it is about the future of this dream. If Professor Pereira were alive today, I think he would be very happy to see that engineering education has expanded in our country and that several other engineering faculties also have been established in other uh, universities. He would be delighted that what he started has grown. And he might also be happy to hear that there are plans being drawn up, hurriedly of course, for a couple more. Perhaps uh, he would uh, also caution us against opening up faculties in a haphazard way without proper planning for its um, uh, infrastructure and human resources. These are not new things. Even in his day, Professor Pereira faced problems like this. In a moment, I will tell you how he handled them. Even though the main interest of Professor Pereira was in engineering education, he was experienced enough and mature enough to realize that a faculty is not an island. A faculty cannot function on its own. It needs the support of several other faculties if it wants to do a good job of producing well-rounded graduates. That is why if you look at any great university in the world, you will find that they have many different faculties dealing with a wide variety of different disciplines. He realized, and I think maybe that was partly at least responsible for his uh, deciding to uh, relinquish the deanship of his beloved faculty that he held for 18 long years, and then go on to accept the vice chancellorship of the University of uh, Ceylon in 1969. This is still true. For the dream of Professor Yoyi Pereira to be realized, to be continued, we need not only the faculties of engineering, but the universities in which they are located, of which they are part of, also to develop at the same time. Therefore, I think that the development of engineering education is inseparable from the development of uh, university education in Sri Lanka. Historically, engineering education in our country has grown with the public university system. That is why I have chosen this particular topic for today's uh, lecture. Challenges facing public universities in Sri Lanka. Let us look at the present uh, situation related to the public uh, universities. By public universities, what I mean uh, are universities 
that receive a substantial portion of uh, their uh, expenses um, from public uh, funds. Now, we are used to what we call state universities. Our present universities are generally called state universities because they get almost the entire funding from the state sector. <laughs> but I would rather call them uh, public universities. Uh, because if you start calling them state universities, it gives this uh, impression that uh, they should be governed by the state, which is not necessarily uh, true. We should be, we should be able to have public universities which are completely autonomous so that they will be able to manage their own affairs. Therefore, I would continue to use the term public universities with this in mind. I would rather trust the public than the state. We have grown up uh, in an environment where public university and public uh, university education has been almost synonymous with free education. So very often when people start talking about uh, public uh, education or public university education, they inevitably mix up these two and start talking about uh, free education. Of course, free education is a very, very important topic that we should be uh, discussing, but not today. These two are separate, and I want to separate them and uh, leave aside the important topic of free education so that we will have time to deal with the issue of public education. Even without the complications uh, caused by free education, public education itself gives us enough uh, challenges. The Sri Lankan public uh, university system started uh, 70 years ago. 70 years is uh, not very old for a university system, it is fairly uh, young. The university, public university system, up to maybe a few years ago, was playing a dual role even up to now. The first role that the public universities have played is the traditional role of uh, universities. That is um, um, education of its citizens, uh, training the professionals, uh, creation of uh, knowledge service uh, to society, and so on. But our public university system, from its inception, has played a second role also. This uh, second role is uh, providing a means of upward uh, social mobility to a wide section of Sri Lankan uh, society. Coupled with the free education, this gave hope of upward social mobility to people from many different uh, strata in our society. I would venture to say that uh, this provided a certain amount of cohesion to our society. So these are the dual roles that the public university system has played. And I would also 
say that they have done a fairly good job in both these roles. Up to maybe a decade ago, there was an important factor that was uh, favorable to public uh, universities. They had a monopoly on university education in this country. Uh, anyone who wanted to go to a university had to go to a public university because that was the only game in town. Uh, this provided the public universities with a very good supply of excellent students, the cream of the um, students. And it also ensured uh, that most of the jobs, uh, especially in the uh, state sector, in high places in the state sector, were filled by the graduates of the public university system. That gave the public universities a prestige, that gave the public universities a prominence. This situation is slowly changing. That is uh, where I want to draw your attention. What has happened is the success of uh, public uh, universities has also created problems. The demand for university education increased sharply, but the state was either unable or unwilling to expand the public uh, university opportunities in step with the increasing uh, demand. So the competition for the limited space in universities intensified. More opportunities for university education became an urgent uh, necessity. The public universities were forced at times to increase their student intakes often without corresponding improvements in the facilities. This happened in the past. This is happening now. If you read uh, this morning's uh, newspapers, you would have seen that decisions have been made that the public university system that normally would accommodate 21,000 students should take in an additional 6,000, I'm sorry, 5,600 uh, students. What are they going to do? How can this kind of sudden, pretty large demands be accommodated? These are issues that the public universities have to face now. Over the past two decades, there has been another problem that has been causing severe a shortage of uh, trained manpower for public universities. The deteriorating uh, economic conditions in this country and the escalating uh, uh, violence that we witnessed some time ago forced or compelled many academics to leave our shores. So there are these two problems that the public universities were faced with. One, increasing student numbers without adequate uh, uh, support facilities. And on the other hand, uh, rapidly, gradually diminishing uh, base of uh, resource, resource persons, mainly human resources. These problems together have strained the public university system. It finds itself 
are struggling to meet these uh, uh, demands. The issue of resources, the issue of funding, funding of public universities and funding of education in general has reached crisis proportions and it has exploded now into an unprecedented uh, strike by the academics in most of our universities. This strike is still unresolved. I wonder what Professor Iyoyi Pereira would have thought about this situation. Some of my uh, <coughs> friends, senior engineers, who were uh, students of Professor Iyoyi Pereira, have told me that uh, Professor Pereira did not look favorably towards the strike by students. So, what would he say if he came to know that the teachers in his Bilal faculty have gone on strike? Most probably, he might not approve of this uh, drastic action. But then again, I have a feeling that he might, he might understand the issues that have prompted us to do this. Because in his day, he himself waged a protest campaign against similar issues, against inadequate funding for the faculty of engineering. Let me tell you what Professor Iyobira did how he protested, what happened. The Faculty of Engineering, which is located at Peradiniya now, was started here in Colombo in 1950. But even when it was established, the plans were there. It was scheduled to be shifted to its permanent uh, um, location at Peradiniya, because that is where the University of Ceylon uh, was to have its seat. So early in the 60s, Professor Pereira, as the dean of the faculty, prepared the meticulous plans to shift everything to Peradin. And he made estimates and submitted his request for funds. Governments are not very different uh, then and now, at least up to this point. The government said uh, this is too much. Um, let us uh, cut it to some manageable size and we'll give you, not everything, but we'll give you some funds. Okay, get moving to Peradi. Professor Pereira would have none of that. He told them what they can do and he tendered his resignation. Now this, became a major issue. It was discussed in the parliament. Why did uh, Professor Pereira submit his resignation? The parliament appointed a committee to look into this. And the committee concluded that the request of Professor Pereira was entirely justified. And then the government restored the funding to the level that Professor Pereira wanted, and then Professor Pereira withdrew his letter of resignation. Now that was then. But what we have is today and now. Now the response is different. Same problem, different responses. The strike by the academic still continues. Over the past several months, many discussions have taken place 
Many newspaper articles have been written. Many presentations have been made arguing for the case of improved funding for public education. Now, to my simple mind, this is a very obvious case. But then, none is so blind as he who does not want to see. That is our problem. People don't see, people who matter don't see the obvious. Not because they can't see, but because they don't want to see. Therefore, we are still in the midst of uh, this crisis. Now, since enough has been said uh, in other fora about this particular issue, I'm not going to um, say anything further about that. Let us leave that aside and proceed to look at various other challenges that our public university system uh, has to face. During the past uh, 10 or 15 years, another important change has taken place uh, in the higher education arena in this country. Private sector organizations have entered into the higher education field and they are offering higher educational or university educational opportunities. Uh, these organizations uh, fall into, say, three broad categories. One, foreign universities. There are two types of students that would uh, go to the foreign universities. One who will go to the foreign universities paying their way through, pay the tuition and go. There is another category of students who will attend these foreign universities on scholarships, sometimes on full scholarships that will take care of everything that you need. Now, why are these uh, foreign universities uh, doing this? Do they feel very sorry for us that our students need places for university education? No, no, no. That is not the situation. University education has now become a globalized enterprise. Every university has realized, they knew it all along, but it has become much more obvious now, that the future well-being of the universities depend on attracting the best students that they can and on attracting the best to, uh, teachers that they can. So the top universities all over the world have expanded their search to cover all the countries in the world in search for the best in those countries. And we are seeing the effect now. We are seeing that some of the best students that come out of our schools are going to uh, these uh, foreign universities. Then there, are the, there is the second category of institutions. Those are institutions uh, based in Sri Lanka, but which have affiliations with foreign universities. So they provide uh, part of their education and the, part, uh, the other part will be provided in the mother university or something like that. The third category is the standalone institutions in Sri Lanka. Now, even though I uh, earlier said that uh, these are the private organizations have entered into this business, it is not 
exactly so, because these standalone institutions in Sri Lanka, some of them are supported by um, state uh, funds, but uh, they charge uh, uh, tuition um, from the students. Now the policy makers have looked at these trends very favorably. I think they think that this is the answer to the increasing demand for university education. So they think that it will relieve the government of the need to provide funding for university education if these avenues become um, wider and more open. But of course, the most of the students who make use of those opportunities will be paying um, their uh, fees to those uh, universities. As a result of this change, today the public universities do not enjoy the monopoly that they used to enjoy in the past. The, a certain amount of competition has been injected into the higher educational sector, and the trend, it looks like, will continue as far as we can see. This seems to be the way things will go. Therefore, the public universities will need to adapt to this new situation and coexist with private entities. Managing the transition from a monopoly to a competitive organization is another crucial challenge facing the public universities. I might even say that it is the most crucial issue. Competition in itself is not bad. Uh, in fact, uh, fair competition could be productive. It forces organizations to become more efficient and creative and innovative. But note that I said uh, fair competition. The operative word is fair. One cannot starve the public universities of much needed funds and then expect them to compete. This is the problem. Once again, we return to the issue of funding. But again, uh, let us sidestep it and leave it aside. How can the public universities prosper under this kind of difficult conditions? It is tough. It is even unfair. But that is the challenge. A great university is not just bricks and mortar. The quality of any university is judged by its output. The graduates, the knowledge creation, and service. All these depend, as I just said earlier also, on the ability to attract good students and good teachers. This is not a secret. Every university tries to do that. Our public universities also need to do that. It is true that funding issues will impact such efforts. But let us leave them aside for now. There are certain things that could perhaps improve the situation. We need to understand our strengths and identify where we have room for improvement and respond accordingly. That is the challenge that we have. For the public university system, one of the key consequences of the competition that uh, they have to face 
is um, the potential loss of uh, good students, particularly to foreign universities that are attracting them with uh, very good uh, scholarships and so on. Foreign universities are aware of this and they pursue our best students quite aggressively. In the past, this was only for graduate students. But now, some of them offer quite attractive uh, scholarships to even undergraduate students. Therefore, it is uh, no surprise that some of our best students find these offers irresistible. But even without such scholarships, uh, there are increasing numbers of students who proceed to foreign universities where they are willing to even pay tuition. I wonder how many of them will return to our country. Even within the country, there are avenues other than the public universities for tertiary education. Now, what should the public universities do? There are two options. The first option is the do nothing option. Quite easy, quite convenient. Let things happen by default and accept what comes your way. But we have seen the results and we can see where it will take us. Starved of funds, constrained by red tape, and handicapped by blatant political appointments, the public universities will gradually lose their prestige and prominence and descend into being second-rate institutions. Along with them, the hope of upward social mobility that provided some degree of cohesion to our stratified and segmented society also will fade away. The consequences of this can be uh, disastrous. You only have to take a look at some hotspots in the world today to see what this kind of frustration can do to peoples. So that is not an option we want to take. There is a second option. It is, of course, more difficult. The public universities have to get into a survival mode because that is what they have to do under these conditions. Get into a survival mode and mobilize all their resources to embark on a revitalization campaign. Uh, this is the way to keep the dream alive. This is the way to keep hope alive. I have laid uh, before you what I think is the present uh, situation with respect to our public uh, universities. The revitalization campaign needs careful planning. It requires the collective wisdom of all stakeholders. It is certainly not a job for one man, but still, I cannot uh, resist the temptation to use the present occasion to offer some suggestions. I know I am going out on a limb, but I will take my chances. Let me try to list the suggestions. Number one, we need to fight fire with fire. We need to find what is attracting our students to 
the competition. What I can see is that we need to elevate the quality of the educational experience and make it much more attractive. Actually, a high quality of the educational experience is currently a strength in our public university system. But we need to preserve that and enhance it wherever possible. Now, some possibilities I can suggest. Number one, recruit, retain highly qualified staff. As I told you earlier, Professor Pereira understood this pretty well. He knew that if he wanted to build up his faculty, the first thing he has to do is get the staff. That holds true still. Over the years, the recruitment uh, procedures in public university systems have been, in some cases, diluted by various administrators who try to find shortcuts. This won't do. This has to be rectified. Once you recruit them, once you recruit the best that you can find, you have to provide adequate funding to train them, get them postgraduate training. In the field that you decide you need, this country, our public universities, have to be ready to spend some money to train the uh, staff that they recruit. The second one is that we have to come back to our basics. Still, the basic function, the main function of our public universities is providing undergraduate education. So we need to pay increased attention to improving the quality of undergraduate education. Some steps are, these are things that many other universities are doing now, okay? We are not trying to reinvent the wheel. These are things that others are doing. These are things that others have found to be effective. So I'm saying that maybe we should try them too. First. You need to increase the contact between the staff and the students. It is that contact that characterizes the university. Otherwise, you can have a lot of books and libraries and laboratories and put the students there and say, OK, you have the facilities, go on. But that is not what happens. It is the personal contact, guidance provided by the teachers that makes the difference that makes the university great. So we need to uh, uh, do that. In order to achieve that, we need to have smaller class sizes. You can't have 400 in a class and try to achieve this uh, close um, contact, close interaction. So we need to uh, look at these things, reduce the class sizes, and uh, Encourage hands-on approaches. Projects and things are used in many other universities quite effectively to get students uh, involved in hands-on activities. And we have to uh, do more of that. And then use technology to t enhance the teaching learning process. Another very important thing is we need to encourage individual excellence in our universities. We should reward such individual excellence and encourage individual excellence because you cannot try to elevate an entire group at once. You have to allow individuals to do well and go up, and then they will slowly get the others up. <coughs> but uh, that is. I'm sorry to say, is not happening in some situations in our university. Another thing that is driving away students from our public universities 
are the disruptions that they find on university uh, campuses. We need to improve the environment on campuses, encourage pursuit of excellence and reward merit, eliminate violence and country, eliminate intimidation and harassment, ensure that individual freedoms are respected. Now, very often, we read in the newspapers about all kinds of conflicts on university campuses, among different student groups. Students following one course, fighting with students in another course. Students are called seniors, trying to intimidate and harass the uh, freshers. And students from uh, one uh, area, fighting with some others, and students fighting with uh, outsiders. All these things are not becoming of a university. The university is where you give freedom to the individuals to pursue their individual goals. That is what we need. And we must ensure that such an environment exists on our campuses if we want to make them attractive to the best students that we have. A graduate must be a good citizen before anything else. So that is one of the key values of education, to produce better citizens who will contribute to better governance and which will elevate all of us. Therefore, I propose that we should introduce a mandatory citizenship education component into all programs. Once again, this is not anything new. In many uh, universities around the world, there is a, a compulsory core requirement that every student must follow. That core is supposed to make them well-rounded citizens who will understand the duty of a citizen, who will understand the basic rights of individuals, who will respect the rights of others, who will know how to elect better people to govern themselves, or still better, who will know how to become a leader and govern the people in a better way. Therefore, this citizenship education is something that we must have. It will improve the quality of the graduates. It will improve the quality of the environment in the university. And hopefully, it will improve our society also. In order to make the universities more attractive to students, we also need to make the university systems more responsive to uh, students' uh, uh, needs. Right now, what I find are very lethargic systems that are very slow to respond to students' uh, genuine uh, needs and requests. It takes a long time. That is not going to work. We must have our systems uh, respond immediately to very simple uh, requirements that the students may have. Now, most of the things that I'm saying here are fairly uh, simple, straightforward uh, things that can be done even within the present uh, uh, low uh, budget uh, situations. These things only require our will and determination to make things better. One last important fact. Today, in Sri Lanka, the age of a student, when he or she enters the university, is 20 years. That is, if everything goes properly, without the uh, uh, ESET score mess-ups and university teacher strikes and so on. 
Even then, it'll be 20 years. In the United States, or in the United Kingdom, that is 18 years. We are losing, compared to them, we are losing two years. Two of the best years of our young men and women's lives. If you think about this, you can see very easily where this waste is taking place. We have our O-level examinations in December. In the old days, long time ago when I was a, a student, they used to have the A-levels also in December. You do the O-levels and then go to the A-level class and continue and do the A-levels also in December. But then someone decided uh, this is not uh, going to work. They postponed the A-levels to April. It went on like that for some time. Then someone said that April is also not good. I don't know why. Maybe you have to celebrate the new year. So April is out. Then what do we do? We push it all the way down to August. And that is where we are. So we have pushed the A-level by about uh, eight or nine months. And then once they sit the A-level, they have to wait for a long time to get their results. And then they have to wait for some more time to hear what the Supreme Court has to say about it. <laughs> and then they have to wait until the university reaches strike is resolved, and then they go to the university, hopefully. So that is where the two years is gone. But you know, the sad truth is that students here, taking all this into consideration, decide that public universities in Sri Lanka are not for them. You don't want to waste two years of your life not doing anything. So what do you do? You decide at an early stage that you are going to go to a foreign university. You plan your academic activities accordingly. And then you will be there two years ahead of your contemporaries in your school. And very often, by the time you return, after your graduation, your friends might still be stuck. This is the reality. We can't just ignore this, saying that these are the problems of the examination department, or that these are the problems of the uh, minister of uh, uh, education, or these are the problems of someone who calculated the ISETCO and all that because these things are going to directly affect the public university system. Therefore, the public universities have to take a much more active role in trying to improve this system and not have the students waste a two years of, two precious years of uh, their life. That, I think, should be a high priority activity for all of us. Then we come to the last couple of points. One is uh, about the course content and uh, the research activities in the universities. I would uh, suggest, I would like to suggest that uh, uh, more emphasis, more than percent emphasis should be placed on uh, basing our uh, course contents and uh, research topics uh, to things that are uh, relevant to local uh, issues, local industry, and so on, wherever possible. I know some, some uh, cannot uh, do that. But the point is, uh, graduates who have uh, experience with local issues will be more useful and productive to our local economies. That is why we need to uh, do that. 
our public universities have a secret weapon that they need to use now. The secret weapon is the, the thousands of graduates they have produced so far, the alumni. We need to um, obtain the assistance of our alumni and well wishes, galvanize them into organized activities and get them to help us, our public university. We need to appeal to their sense of loyalty, their sense of gratitude, and get them to help us. In many other parts of the world, this is happening at a much larger scale. Just to give you one example, just a couple of weeks ago, I was reading about the University of Illinois fundraising activities. They had a fundraising campaign called the Brilliant Futures campaign. Lasted from 2003 to 2011. At the end of 2011, they announced that the Brilliant uh, Minds, I think, Brilliant uh, Futures campaign has got a grand total of 2.45 billion US dollars. Billion with a B. Okay? Everything from <coughs> their alumni, well wishers, and uh, corporations and companies uh, that were interested in the well being and the development of the university. They reported that there were 400 donations that exceeded $1 million each. Now, I'm not saying, don't worry, I'm not saying that we want you to contribute $1 million uh, or even 1 million rupees to uh, your alma mater. But my point is, I have met many graduates who are very keen to help. But there is no good mechanism to get them to help the universities in a regular way. That is a, a resource, that is an asset that we have, but we have not yet exploited it to the maximum possible extent. We have to uh, do that. With all this, with all the funding restrictions, with all the starvation for funds, I feel that we must maintain public university education as an affordable option for our people. It should be within the grasp uh, of all um, different uh, um, segments of uh, society. At the moment, the free education that we have enjoyed, the free education that the public universities have provided so far is a strength of our system. It is an asset. It goes a long way to instill a sense of loyalty, a sense of gratitude in the hearts and minds of the alumni. And as I explained earlier, this affordability of university education is one cohesive force that is keeping our society together. Therefore, we must strive hard to still maintain the affordability of our university education. Now, to do all this, there are two very important things that we must do. One, regain the lost autonomy of the universities. That is uh, much easier said than done. There was a time, long time ago, when the university was autonomous to a great extent. But over the years, partially due to the action of the university, done some of the university dons themselves, we have lost a fair portion of the university's autonomy. 
And the universities are sometimes reluctant to even exercise the little bit of autonomy that is left for them. Both problems are there. But if we want the universities to respond quickly and in effective ways to the present uh, problems that they face, we must allow the universities to manage their own affairs, give back the autonomy to the universities, but hold them responsible. Tell them you can manage your own affairs, but we must see good results. Then comes the last hurdle. Now, if you want the universities uh, to be effective, if you want the universities uh, to be productive, if you want the universities to be attractive, and if you want the universities to be autonomous, you need very good people at their head. The leaders of the universities need to be competent people. <coughs> These leadership positions in universities must be filled with people who are eminently suitable for such roles by virtue of their abilities and credentials, not merely their political loyalties. Therefore, uh, we must, if we are serious, if this country is serious about preserving and developing further the public education system, they must avoid political interference in the university affairs, especially when it comes to the appointments of councils and high officials. The quality of the people must be the only guide that should be used. I know this list is long. People have even started leaving. <laughs> but the list might even go longer when we open it for stakeholders to uh, contribute. The tasks that we are listing are difficult. They're hard. But we owe it to this country. And above all, we owe it to ourselves to try to do that. If we succeed, our public universities will flourish. Not only that, the dreams of the many dedicated academics, like Professor E.O.E. Pereira, who spent almost all their lives working for the development of our public universities, also will be realized. Their dreams will be won, and we will be able to realize their dreams. And I hope their dreams are our dreams too. But above all, the hopes of the vast majority of the people of this country will come true. That is all we can ask for. I urge all of you who are, I am sure, extremely interested in the well-being of our university system and the engineering education system I urge all of you, as stakeholders in our public university system, to help the universities to meet these challenges. They need all the help they can get. They need your help, and they need your friends' help. They need your batchmates' help, everyone's help. Please do that. The future generations of students will thank you for it.
directly call upon uh, uh, Chairman uh, Civil Engineering Section and Committee Engineer Nichanka Vasudhandara to propose the total plans, and with that, we will conclude the day's proceedings. Thank you, Engineer Ms. Arundhati, the Executive Secretary of the institution, the President of IESL, the President-elect, the resource person, uh, the son of the late Professor E.O. Iperira, immediate past president, past presidents, council members, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, including my own teachers from the University of Peradeniya. At this event, a great engineering pioneers memorial lecture, I respectfully consider the opportunity to deliver a few words as an opportunity, a privilege, and honor. The resource person, engineer, Dr. Nihal Somaratna, we thank for accepting our invitation and for your commitment to deliver this lecture. Of course, I have to mention these two names also, the former Vice Chancellor of the University of Peradeniya, Professor Abe Kohn, and Professor N.P. Ranavira, who guided and supported us to contact this resource person and organize this event in a successful manner. Mr. Brian Pereira, the son of the late Professor Yoi Pereira. Uh, it is great that you participate in this event. We thank you so much. And also the president of IESL, the president-elect, we as organizers, thank you so much for uh, raising this occasion and participating. The Executive Secretary of IESL and the staff, without their excellent support, we would not have been able to make this event a success. Once again, we thank you all very much for uh, your contribution made in organizing this activity. Not at last, not the least, I would like to convey our thanks to today's audience for your participation and valuable time is spent. If not, this event could not be a success. Thank you all and wish you a nice evening. Thanks.